Healthcare Service Excellence by Suresh Ramu, who is the co-founder and the CEO of one of the finest cancer hospitals in the country. And um, he and his team have been uh, doing phenomenal work in this area. Like I've written, uh, not just in uh, service excellence, but also in patient care. I don't know those of you are following uh, uh, you know, uh, this company's uh, LinkedIn page. I get to see every alternate day something other coming up, even as simple as uh, the way they treat their security guards, the patient attendance, not just the patient, but attendance with very innovative things like uh, you know, engaging their with music, entertainment, etc. And also a lot of them happen to be from uh, different parts of the kind of world, not just from India. So it has been a global phenomena. I think uh, that's all led by Suresh and we have uh, he himself uh, you know, uh, going to be talking to us. And before I hand over the platform to him, let me have the pleasure of introducing him formally. Uh, Suresh Ramo uh, is a graduate from uh, uh, in IIT Madras, uh, also, and also from MBA uh, in Calcutta. And uh, he has begun his uh, career with uh, Last and Two Pro Limited Mumbai as engineer training. And you, you can see, you know, uh, he was engineer in uh, you know, uh, uh, chemical engineering, by the way. And then from that, MBA, and then what he is right now. So having uh, after having uh, you know his stint at the Last and Two Pro uh, as uh, engineer training, he was with Price House Waterhouse Coopers. PwC, as it's called now, right, uh, as consultant process improvement and supply chain management for two years and two months. And after that, uh, he has been now uh, with uh, Rickson, uh, Dr. Anyway.com, Private Limited, Pune, as product manager and management uh, representative for one year and five months. After that, uh, just uh, right uh, before, you know, he became the co-founder and CEO, the longest stint he had was with uh, this great company, uh, uh, called uh, Quintiles uh, Transnational, where he was with uh, them for nine years and uh, six months in different capacities, last one being Vice President Head, India uh, Clinical Development Services. And uh, since 2011, he has been the co-founder and uh, director at uh, Site Space uh, Research uh, Private Limited, and also the co-founder of uh, this great uh, institution called uh, Sitecare Hospitals, and precisely from April 2014. And like I said, uh, Sitecare Hospital is creating a network of comprehensive, patient-centric, organ-based cancer care hospitals in India. The first hospital in the network is uh, 150 bedded uh, facility in Bangalore that went live in November 2016 and has seen over 10,000 patients from India and over 25 countries in the last three years. And uh, I'm sure those of you Bangalore or those of you want to be uh, interested in healthcare sector, this is one of the th things to visit, not just for the kind of uh, service that they do, but the kind of uh, back-end process that have kept in place so that every patient uh, and also the attendant that comes with the patient gets amazing service, amazing uh, experience, not just uh, in terms of service. So uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Suresh himself talk to us about how in this industry, healthcare industry, the service excellence is pursued and also uh, uh, nurtured uh, for all the benefit of all the patients. Over to you, uh, uh, Suresh. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nagendra, for your kind words and introduction. It is my honor and privilege to be part of this. And I believe uh, many of the people um, in the audience uh, are pursuing healthcare or are interested in healthcare. And I think um, healthcare is something that is indispensable um, and has a broad spectrum of things that we look at in healthcare. Today, uh, over the next maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, if I can, I'll try and say what is my perspective in terms of healthcare excellence and uh, excellence with empathy, where which is one of my um, areas of interest pers personally. Um, so let me pull up uh, the presentation uh, that I have got today for everybody. I hope this is visible. So, you know, excellence with empathy. Uh, excellence is a journey, as we know. And what is empathy? And we'll try and touch upon that. I do believe it's a long march. And there are many, many aspects of what we need to be doing in healthcare delivery, specifically. So, Alan Turing said this, we can see only a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. Essentially telling us there's miles to go before we sleep, really. A lot of work has happened over the last 
two, three decades, maybe in terms of um, how we are dealing with healthcare. Uh, healthcare has come a very long way, but I do believe we still have a very long way to go in terms of dealing with healthcare excellence with empathy. The global disease burden has really shifted over the last three decades. If you look at now the disease burden, and this is the global disease burden, and India is no, no different, cardiovascular and cancers have really taken the center stage in terms of disease burden as well as mortality. What it really means is that we used to deal with infectious diseases for decades and for the last 15 years in India, we've definitely seen the non-communicable diseases rise and exceed what we, are, what we have seen in infectious diseases. This really changes the way we look at healthcare delivery because when we were dealing with infectious diseases, the protocols of care, the time duration of care was a lot more acute, a lot more short duration. Uh, whereas if you look at cardiovasculars, the cancers, uh, diabetes, hypertension, these are almost life cycle or entire life uh, management diseases. So you need to think about how healthcare is really morphing itself to manage the life cycle of a patient, of a person, of an individual. We also are beginning to see uh, a lot more focus on well-being, and which means that when people are already well, what can we do to prevent disease? And the Western world has really taken a lot of focus on that. I think India was known for welfare, well-being and uh, preventive. And I think now uh, with lifestyle changes, really need to focus back our attentions on well-being and, uh, and lifestyle management. As the disease burden also becomes more non-communicable and the fact that we have many wonder drugs that have saved us from the infectious diseases, um, our mortality rates have dropped. Our life span has now become 76 years from what it was in the 1950s at 42 years globally. Um, and the Western world is now exceeding 82 years in terms of the advanced healthcare opportunities. The disease burden, uh, is obviously increasing because as we live longer, nature finds its way to to uh, come back to us. And cancer, therefore, is one of the na nature's way of um, defeating the human race. But I think we have we have done a lot of progress in terms of new medications. But also the 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 point is that as we live longer, the burden of disease is only going to increase because the number of people living longer is also exponentially increasing. And I think India is going to become the senior living capital of the world within about the next 15 years, which probably a lot of people don't realize that the burden in India specifically on diseases, as well as um, seniors living is going to increase quite a, quite a bit. But what has happened in terms of the change in the burden of the disease? And if you look at this on a, on a relative uh, chart, if 1990 was 0% and relative to 19, uh, 1990, you see that the under fives, the neonatals, the, uh, the disease burden has dramatically dropped, which means we've made significant progress. Essentially, the under fives, we've really been able to make significant progress. The vaccines, the maternity care, uh, the, the fact that we are able to address neonatal care across the world. And this is not only uh, the Western world, but you know, India, Africa, all of the developing nations, we've been able to really make an impact in terms of the under five. We are also seeing impact on the children, uh, five to 14. And then you can see that the five, 15 to 49 is, uh, is also seen about 12 to 13% impact. But the lines are flattening as you go closer to 2000 and 15, and you look at the age group 15 and above, you do see that the lines of relative change in the burden of disease is really flattening. What it can tell you is that the population is growing. Uh, the disease burden is not necessarily coming down at the same rate that we saw in the past, which essentially means we're going to see growing burden of disease as we progress over the next few years. And in fact, there are enough conversations about the fact that though we have seen an increase in the longevity of life, we may actually start seeing a reduction in the longevity of life because of the change in the lifestyles and the way we live and the way we eat, the, the pollution and the food pollution particularly that uh, we all are in.
deeper in terms of what we're going to do um, when uh, we grow older. Let's also look at disease burden versus the healthcare expenditure per capita. Right? So if you if you look at the um, per capita spends in the United States is the far extreme on the right uh, with really relatively speaking lower disease burdens and the African countries in purple are on the top with very high disease burdens and obviously lower spends. India is somewhere in the middle, catching up, growing better. China is uh, on the on actually has shown lower disease burden now and with a higher spend in terms of healthcare. So this chart essentially is telling you that there is disproportionate spends uh, versus the disease burdens in the world. This is a very large problem, and I think it is leading to issues, is going to lead to greater issues in healthcare, but also in terms of rights, human rights, in terms of what people will demand. The politics of the world is definitely something which is uh, at risk. And I think we have seen some of that play out during the COVID-19 crisis with the vaccines and the availability of the vaccines and how that might play out in the future is something that we all need to be concerned. One of the other big problems, and I think I really see this in cancer where we deal with in site care, is the late detection of the disease. Now, it's unfortunate that uh, we, we may have cures for several of the cancers, but we are not able to catch these cancers early, as early as we should. This is probably because of lack of awareness and the low penetration of screening programs, but I think in India specifically, there is also fear, there's also stigma, and there are, you know, there is just inertia in terms of going out and doing health checks. I don't think we have forced programs that, even in coppers, that actually make the person go and do a health check, encourage them strongly or assertively to go and get health checks done. I think this is this is really affecting us. We have a, det a cancer detection rate of less than 30%, which is a disaster, because by the time we detect Many of these cancers, like breast and lung, only 15 or 30 percent of these cancers are detected early. Breast uh, and, and lung are actually many very curable cancers if, uh, if picked up in the early stages and 70, 80 percent of them are not picked up uh, early at all. And this is really resulting in a high mortality rate, high burden of uh, costs. Uh, the family goes through enormous challenges, obviously dealing with it. And the, the entire disease, so to speak, creates further fear and stigma, which further probably prevents us to go back and do early detection. So this may be a question for all of you and maybe somebody in the audience to think about what we can do. I can share some things that we are doing in that uh, in this regard, but I think there's a lot of work that we all need to do in the community to figure out how do we communicate to us stupid adults in terms of going there and getting ourselves checked early, because if we do catch it early, we can really cure it at a lower cost. Now, why is cost such a big thing? Because the drug development process, and this is one of the big parts, you know, I've been in clinical research for a few years, and the the life cycle of clinical drug development or pharmaceutical drug development or biopharma drug development is extremely long. It goes to almost 15 to 20 years sometimes. Uh, the COVID vaccine, the 19 vaccine, was a stellar example of how many of those cycles of development can be cut short. It required global collaboration between academia, the scientists, the government, the regulator. It required tremendous teamwork and bringing the science to the market because we had a crisis in front of us. But traditionally, what we have seen in terms of the drug development processes, we take a very long time. It is very, very expensive. And the failure rates are enormous. So if you see on the left-hand side, the blue bar, which is a large bar, that's, those are the number of candidate molecules or targets, as we call them. And by the time you come to launch, you have very few molecules that are actually going to get approved. So the cost of failure is essentially what is one of the reasons why we are seeing increase in cost of the drug when it comes to the market. And obviously, timeline is a big issue because if we were able to do uh, catch it early and get it fail fast, as we say, and get the right candidate early, we can actually reduce the cost of the drugs that are coming to market. So there's a lot of work that's happening in this field. Uh, there's a lot of technology. There is a high throughput screening methods that are being used in the semiconductor industry are being applied. 
uh, we're doing a lot of work inside care, for example, working with biopharma where we can test drugs ex vivo, which is in live tissues rather than doing uh, animal trials first because you know the efficacy in live tissue uh, environment and then go into uh, preclinical and clinical. But there is a lot more that needs to be done to, to find ways to break through in terms of getting the newer drugs to market and also therefore keeping the costs lower because many of these drugs are uh, unaffordable. I mean, some of the newer immun immunotherapies and um, for example, CAR T therapies are, can cost up to a half a million dollars for a patient going through the treatment, which is unaffordable obviously in any part of the world. The, the, the challenge is without insurance, without um, universal healthcare, we are going to be in, it's going to be impossible to support the patients even if we have these wonder drugs that are being created. So there's there's a lot of work that's happening. There's a lot of change, but I do think there's an opportunity here uh, and continues to be a big opportunity here to improvise and impact this drug development life cycle. There are many players in the healthcare journey that a patient encounters, right? And the patient is the center of all of our conversations. There is no really healthcare without a patient. And I think we need to put the patient out there in the center, but there are many players, the hospital, the doctor, the insurance provider or the payer, uh, increasingly now in India as well, we are seeing a lot more patients getting insured. However, the value of the insurance is very, very low. It's typically in the range of two to five lakh rupees, um, but that's really no good in terms of uh, covering uh, people in terms of private healthcare. The biopharma is another player. There are labs, there are radiologies, there are diagnostics. There's a digital intermediary who now helps patients find the right doctor, find the right uh, you know, hospital, et cetera. There are, there are so many players in the ecosystem. Uh, all of these really need to work with each other. There's a lot of opportunity to collaborate. There's a lot of opportunity for exchange of information. A lot of this is currently extraordinarily siloed. Um, the patient records obviously are not transferable. There are many issues that we already know. All of these, there are many players trying to fix this. But a big part of what I wanted to say today is also the fact that there is enormous trust deficit um, between every one of these uh, in, in players, right? So whether it's the patient in the hospital, the hospital and the doctor, the insurance provider in the hospital, the biopharma and the patient or the, or the doctor, the lab and the diagnostic provider and the patient or the digital intermediary and in, who's playing a role. So I think while there is, there are many players and there's a need for many players, the trust deficit really increases the cost of transaction um, multifold, in my opinion, because we don't, we are unable to collaborate, we are unable to put the patient back at the center of why we exist and bring all of that to the benefit of the patient. This is, in my opinion, the biggest challenge the world is seeing today. And I think unless we uh, bring back trust in the ways we deal with each other and are able to collaborate, the cost of healthcare delivery will probably continue to escalate. Why is there trust deficit? And I think the, there is obviously reality in terms of why people may not trust each other. And some of these are well-known stories up there, you know, the Ranbaxy story of the bottle of lies or the regulation issues that we see in developing economies like India in the truth pill or the Theranos story, uh, which, which promised a liquid biopsy that could really catch all diseases with a single blood test. Uh, though a lot of work is happening in that whole area of uh, a single blood test, I think the fact that it was launched before it was really um, tested, before it was real, and the fact that you know multi-million dollar company was created out of something that did not exist, a lot of this creates, in my opinion, mistrust, distrust. People now worry in terms of uh, going to a hospital and saying, am I getting the right care? Is this doctor recommending the right treatment? Is this uh, appropriate for me? Should I get a second opinion, a third opinion? Um, you know, is this person really trained enough to deliver this treatment for me? Why are they, treat why are they so expensive? Why is this drug being um, sold? Uh, you know, th there are countries, uh, you know, neighboring countries, which have, uh, and including India, we have seen that there are spurious drugs in the marketplace. Is this, uh, you know, there are, branded drugs, which are obviously not 
uh, original, but we have unbranded drugs, which are uh, equivalents, which are being sold as generics uh, with not the appropriate approval processes. So there is a lot of issues that we are really dealing with in, in the country and in the developing world. Uh, but this is true globally as well. And I that is creating a lot of distrust, which results in essentially a higher cost of transaction for everything that we do in healthcare. So I thought we can step back a bit and say, what is that that we are trying to do? And what are those principles? Um, and I come from a clinical research background, as was mentioned earlier, and I learned this many years ago, that the three broad principles of good clinical practice, the first is respect for persons. The second is justice. And the third is beneficence. Now, respect is a is a very large topic, and it is also about autonomy. It's about decision making by that individual patient. Uh, many, many, many societies are not necessarily autonomous in the way we think. Even our societies sometimes can uh, be driven by how the family thinks, for example, or a village thinks. Uh, and is there real autonomy for that patient? Is there real autonomy for the person to think? I think these are fundamental questions in terms of how our societal structure may determine healthcare outcomes or healthcare practices or what we do in terms of selection, selecting options as a patient. The second is beneficence. Is this, are we thinking about the individual good versus the social good or the, the good for society, right? Uh, in the COVID vaccine era, this was particularly played out. How much time did we have to test out some of these vaccines in the smaller individual for the individual good versus the large society? Um, and the speed of that and the risk versus benefit concepts are all boxed in in the beneficence uh, circle. And justice, are we biased? Are we... Uh, collecting right individuals when we do clinical trials or when we dispense drugs or when we give access to medicines, are we giving it to people who really, and uh, again, I think this is an issue that access, affordability, all of that has to go together if we're really trying to bring healthcare to one and all. And I think this is a very large issue that the world is facing today because healthcare costs are rising, drug costs are rising. So as services and uh, drug costs increase, is getting out of reach uh, of the common man who is may not be insured unless there is universal health care. Universal health care is also questioned now in many countries which had provided this. They are not able to fund this as the population is living longer. The costs of health care are going through the roof. So we really need to re rethink and apply these principles back to health care. And the, this is important when we think about the three pillars of health care. And we've often asked ourselves of site care um, or a healthcare institution that we run, is that why do we really need to exist? I mean, do we really need to be another hospital out there? And I think the issue of distrust, the issue of um, you know, the lack of access and affordability really brings back the need for better institutions that deliver that. And there are three pillars as we see it. The first is the right treatment. And the right treatment is about governance. Are we sure as a healthcare provider, as a doctor, who really has the knowledge of what is being done for that patient, should have the knowledge for what is being done to the patient, is the right treatment being given or suggested to that patient? And I think this is extraordinarily fundamental in bringing the trust uh, back into the equation, at least at the, uh, the delivery side. For this, there are many approaches. And I think one of the approaches that we have seen with great success is the multidisciplinary approach. If every decision is taken with multiple people being involved in who think for the patient, who are thinking not about um, individual expertise or commercial proposition or anything else that might bias the decision, but we think always in terms of what the patient will benefit. Is it evidence-based? Are there protocols which are standardized? Is this coming from cutting edge research? And are we learning on what is happening? The world of, for example, in cancer care, there may be almost 20 or 25 uh, new articles on cutting edge in every type of cancer coming out every day. How is an oncologist going to keep up with that, right? So there is a need to understand can bring all of this together to consider what is right for the patient. The second is 
as a delivery of tariffs, right? So this is obviously what we are all working towards is, you know, is it is it really best in class? Is the right clinician made available for that treatment? Is nursing care, uh, the, the right nursing care being considered? Are the people competent? You know, is there a Six Sigma way? A very few healthcare institutions really in the country I've seen are on a Six Sigma path of improvement, right? And Six Sigma is the error rates that you would see one in and three in a million. And are we are we tracking error rates to that level? Do we have processes of continuous improvement which are based on these uh, error rates? Do we learn so fast? Or is our learnability, as we call it, improving at the rate to create a delivery system that we really need? And I think this is something that the healthcare institutions really, really need to work on as well. But the third is something that is also very, very important. And it's not just about being nice and loving and caring, which is often understood by the patients, but there is also a whole periclinical angle to what is maybe part of the treatment. In fact, making significant changes in terms of the outcomes of clinical care. And that is the periclin, the mental well-being, the nutrition, the physiotherapy, the palliative care processes, the navigators who are maybe providing hope or help the patients understand or patient advocacy groups. Um, but there is also a patient experience program that in terms of how does the patient really feel when they go through the journey of uh, going through healthcare services, right? And if you extend this to beyond being a patient, to being to service people who are healthy, who are looking at it from a well-being perspective, this becomes even more important. So there's a lot of work that uh, is happening in the world to to understand what is empathy, what is care, and what are those periclinical processes that uh, can be integrated into the clinical delivery so that we create better outcomes uh, for the patient. So the big issue that we talked about was lack of awareness. So there's a lot that we have to do in terms of, uh, obviously, early detection, prevention, screening, right? Uh, tobacco, for example, is a leading cause of cancer. Almost 40% of all cancers in India are directly attributed to tobacco. And the average, or not the average, the median age of um, tobacco, starting usage of tobacco is supposedly 14 and a half in India, which is kids in school. And that is shocking, but it's probably true that there is some form of tobacco exposure that is coming in very early for children. And this is what we are doing in terms of the next generation. I think our own success is that when we talk to adults, we see that there is some level of understanding of the subject. But with children, the understanding not only is on the subject itself, but there are multiple impacts of talking to children. We realize that children absorb the information better. They probably internalize it more, and therefore they will probably be more aware about some of these topics and avoid and therefore prevent disease by being more aware. But they also do something to the community. They go out there, they ask questions, as you can see in this uh, picture. They're, they're very inquisitive. They're very, very curious. And I think that is important because that can lead to early detection and also early screening. I think the stigmas and the fears that we have about going into hospitals and getting ourselves screened early, I think the kids have very less or none, no fear at all. Um, they are, I think, the ambassadors of change that we are very, very hopeful about. So Sidecare has been in existence for six years. I thought I'll spend a few minutes using our own example, but talking about some of the things that we believe that we can do. There's a lot of technology that you can implement really in the healthcare delivery processes. I've just picked up one slide because there's a lot we can talk about. Uh, the telemedicine processes, there are a lot of smart healthcare devices now that are, there is a lot of wearables now that has come into the marketplace. And really talking about the lab in a box or lab in a phone, there's a lot of diagnostics now that you can do with your phone itself. So technology plays an enormous role because it makes healthcare more accessible probably much, much lower in cost and more real time and probably integrates the records of the patient over a period of time. And we'll see that integration with the standardization that the government is bringing in in India as well in terms of data repositories. I think we will see a lot more of this play out in the world. We're also already seeing that in the developed economies where a lot of the medical records are now accessible in your pocket 
and you can go to any service provider. There are challenges on the healthcare delivery side in many of those countries. But I think if we see, if we fast forward, there is a lot of promise in the applications of technology in healthcare. But there's also design. And I think a lot of our hospitals, a lot of our healthcare delivery centers were designed from a equipment perspective. They were designed, and equipment were designed primarily from a doctor perspective, for a delivery of services perspective, not necessarily always from a patient perspective. Hospitals have been designed from you know delivery of services perspective, which is why the patient has to travel from one floor to another floor, very often between rooms, et cetera, uh, because uh, that's how the facilities have been designed. And if you think about the five senses that a human being has, or six, if you want to think about that, you need to really think about design from a very, very different perspective. The smell of coffee uh, or the music that you can have or the touch that you can provide in terms of the good touch and what you see and how you feel encouraged when you go into treatments rather than scared. Can you play music for the patient which is customized? Can you, you, know, can you create an experience which really makes them less afraid and more in tune with themselves in terms of what they're getting in for treatment. All of this is possible if we have the right value systems, which is obviously respect, which we talked about earlier, but integrity, you know, doing the right thing for the patient is absolutely at the core of this. There is a need to be commercially successful. There is a dependence on the investors, but I think everybody in the world will understand that Healthcare is a long gestation life cycle, eight to 10 years. And I think you, you re, we, one really needs to bring back integrity into this to see how we can create more impact. Uh, that requires grit or perseverance or dedication. Uh, we talked about empathy and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But teamwork, right? There are multiple players. There's a radiologist, uh, you know, the pathologist, the clinicians of different kinds. There are super specialists now today available for every area of expertise. Uh, there are obviously we talked about the different providers uh, and the players in the industry. There is enormous amount of teamwork, all focused on the patient at the center. And I think these right values, along with those guiding principles and technologies and processes, can create better healthcare solutions for us. But the large topic, and I want to leave this talk with you guys um, and then maybe open up, is can there really be a process for empathy? Because I've always heard that empathy is something that you were born with. Empathy is something that you are, uh, you know, you either have it or you don't have it. Is that really true? Or can we create a process for empathy in organization uh, in that we work for or we are part of, and especially in healthcare, especially in healthcare, right? So I think some of these things that we are learning along the way, and there's obviously a long way to go, is celebrate every moment. Can we can we enjoy the current moment? I know that everybody wants to get better. Everyone wants to improve, grow in their lives. But can we just celebrate? Can we just pause and say, hey, I'm grateful. I'm just so happy about the current moment, right? Celebrating the right moment. So when we finish a treatment, can we ring the bell? Can we say, wonderful, great job, and be back again? So that improves compliance. That improves outcomes because the patient is encouraged to come back to an environment which is, which is happy. Um, can we get kids into the equation? Because kids, you know, they just bring in so much joy. They bring in so much love and care. And that is something that healthcare delivery spaces need to uh, have. I mean, it's just a happier space when you when you when you do that. Can we donate more as healthy volunteers? Can we donate blood? Can we donate time? Can we donate more money if we have uh, some of it to donate to needy patients? Just the fact that you'd give something, I think, gets you back a lot more. And that creates also an environment of happiness, of gratitude. And that, again, brings back maybe a lot more empathy. We remember the, those that have passed. We are a cancer hospital. We have a program called Samarpan. And I think it brings our the nursing care, the providers and management to say, we're just not providing service to some patient, somebody out there. It's a named person, the named person with a family. And if you just give remembrance, I think a lot of that empathy comes back into the equation. We also run inclusion programs. And one of those is a, a cafe that we have. It's called Mitti Cafe. And some of you may have heard of it. And these are people with disabilities. Actually, they're people with uh, different abilities, but they are people with superior abilities than uh, what I would call typical people like us. They're always smiling. And they can smile even though their body physically is extraordinarily deb debilitated. This is incredible that the human spirit is so strong. And when you see them happy, when, they, when you see them committed and serving patients in their coffee shop, 
it just gives you back that maybe we should have more gratitude. And I think all of that may contribute back to increasing empathy and recognition. So we run a program called Magic Fingers where visually uh, visually impaired girls are trained to do breast cancer screening. And uh, this is a program that was uh, created in Germany called Discovering Hands. It's been brought to India by an, a not-for-profit called Enable India. I'm very proud that Sidecare has been able to associate ourselves with it. But seeing people who are visually impaired, who have the ability because they are magic fingers, they have got the superior ability to pick uh, tumors uh, in the breast much earlier than maybe many others, is something that can create empathy in the way we deal with each other. So these are some of the things that we are trying to do. Uh, there is a long journey and a long path in terms of excellence, as I explained. I think um, empathy to me is also a journey that an organization as an individual goes through. It is something that we can learn, we can train ourselves on. And the core part of excellence uh, will contribute to the three pillars of healthcare delivery that we talked about, which is excellence in terms of governance, in terms of delivery, and empathy and care. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Suresh. It's an absolute pleasure. And I think that there's so much that you know you've covered in just about and uh, roughly about you know, 35, 40 minutes. And I think uh, it's so, I mean, congratulations to you and your you know, uh, entire team you know, for uh, setting up these kind of standards. Now, we will have a few questions and quite a few questions actually, but with your permission, uh, let me take a one, each one of them. Sure. Yeah. So uh, this is the uh, first question uh, is from Mr. Krishnakant Malviya. The question is, uh, what are the major driving factors which are contributing to the escalation of the price of the services? Why government is not able to keep up, keep a tab on the insurance and healthcare organizations like it, uh, it is done in other countries. Thank you, Krishnakant. Thank you. I think uh, very valuable question in terms of affordability of healthcare really becoming a challenge now. So I think there are both challenges, right? There's access challenge and there's affordability challenge. And I think um, as technology comes in, we will have newer medications, but also the cost of the medications, the cost of treatment is increasing. Um, the expectations from the customer is also increasing in terms of healthcare delivery. Um, uh, I think the uh, one of the reasons I attributed already to the long development cycles, which creates a higher cost of uh, the drug development process, and in turn, therefore, the cost of medications, the, the long patent timelines that have to be granted, because otherwise the innovation industry will sti will be stifled because you need to allow for exclusivity for some periods of time to recover for the companies to recover the cost of investment i think the entire model may have to be turned on its head in terms of innovation and working backwards really from the patient side in terms of figuring out what would the patient really want how can we bring them in into the um, uh, into the development cycle can reduce the cost of drugs. But the cost of services also is going up. The, you know, everything is, uh, you know, inflation is driving costs. I think the cost of health education is also driving the cost of uh, services that we are providing. So the entire industry and is dependent on the suppliers, like the doctors and nurses. And if you're seeing the input costs going up, the real estate costs going up, obviously the delivery costs are going to go up. So the government really can partner maybe with institutions, increase the cost of assured level of uh, volumes. Uh, a lot of this is being tried with the Ayushman Bharat schemes and the universal healthcare schemes. I think we need to see better pricing so that more institutions can participate because the current pricings are unviable for a lot of uh, providers, maybe tiered pricing based on the quality of service and the and maybe copay mechanisms so that patients have a choice can reduce the burden of healthcare costs. Thank you. Um, uh, this is a question from Mr. Mr. Mamta Chandra, and her question is: Is there any research being done to lower the cost of cancer detection? Thank you, Mamta. Thank you, Mamta. I think the, uh, there's a lot of work that's being tried. As I mentioned, one of the things that um, really believe people are trying is to can a liquid biopsy, that is, can a blood test uh, pick up some cancers really early, right? Right now, a lot of radiology, a lot of um, uh, testing has to be done to pick up cancers. You need multiple things like an MRI, a CT scan, a PET CT scan, and a lot of imaging uh, is obviously possible with large uh, machines, large infrastructure, large spaces. Uh, tech, train technical people, 
etc but if we can pick this up through blood tests it obviously would be breakthrough so there's a lot of work happening in the in that area i think we're also seeing that we can use uh, telemedicine and teleradiology to centralize some of these costs use artificial intelligence to read out some of these um, diagnostics without the need for human intervention repeatedly that again can reduce the, the cost of uh, diagnostics quite uh, significantly. I think early screening is one of the biggest things where we will see a, a greater impact in terms of the life cycle cost of treatment, because we really need to move to think not about the transactional cost of healthcare delivery, which is, for example, just the surgery or just that specific episode that we deal with, but we need to think about the life cycle cost. And I think a lot of innovation in terms of managing the life cycle cost has to still come in. Thank you, uh, uh, Suresh. And uh, the next question is from uh, Ramya Prasad. Her question is, good evening. As we are talking uh, much about healthcare and life expectancy, how do we diagnose cancer at, uh, uh, at early stages or any cancer for that matter? How do we handle the cost of treatment? How to avoid getting the cancer through good life, good lifestyle or eating habits? Thank you, Ramya. So I think the cost question um, we addressed. See, the, the question about lifestyle is, it's an easier one, uh, but a difficult one to implement. To answer is exercise, good food, you know, as organic and vegetarian as possible, I think is proven now that red meat has uh, direct, um, you know, excess red meat has direct consequences on some of these diseases is a controversial topic. But I think there is enough literature in that whole area. Uh, I think the way we use pesticides obviously is uh, is uh, is destroying the quality of the food. I think going back to organic, going back to uh, multiple uh, types of farming rather than large scale farming will probably reduce um, the number of mutations that we see in the body because we are what we are. What we eat is what we become. I think food is one of the biggest things. Exercise is another big thing. The lifestyle. Uh, do we sleep enough? Do we get enough sleep? Do we sleep early um, or, uh, you know, get up? get up early? Do we exercise? Uh, do you give enough time between when you eat and when you sleep? What is the consumption of alcohol? The percentage of smokers now is increasing in lower populations. All of these have absolute direct consequences in terms of our health. But bigger than that is the fact that we don't catch it early. I think screening, and uh, as I mentioned, there each of the cancers, especially cancer, because you're talking about that, there are specific uh, diagnostic, non-invasive diagnostic tests that are available. I think about the age of 40 specifically, I think many steps can be taken to reduce the incidence of later stage cancers. We are seeing almost 70% late stage cancers in a hospital like SiteCare, where we largely receive educated middle class, upper middle class patients, right? And, and this is unfortunate because people who could have done something about it are probably going late in terms of detection. And there are simple but annual, biannual, in non-invasive tests that can be done to detect these cancers early. Even if we don't have a single blood test, uh, I think it's still worth spending a few thousand rupees, maybe four or five thousand rupees uh, in a year or two years and catching the cancer early. But they're very, very simple tests that are available. Thank you, uh, Suresh. And uh, we have uh, three different questions from Dr. Tushar uh, Dev. Let me uh, take uh, all of them together. One is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted cancer diagnosis and the treatment in India? And what measures have been taken to address these challenges? That's one. And the second one is related to some points on the role of uh, uh, early cancer detection and awareness campaigns in re reducing cancer mortality rates in India. That's the second one, Suresh. And the last one that he has is, what steps can individuals take to reduce their risk of developing cancer in India, considering lifestyle and dietary choices? Thank you, Dr. Tushar. Thank you, Dr. Tushar. I think the COVID impact was quite severe during the two and a half, three years that we saw each phase. There were challenges both in terms of patients or people, healthy people with some suspicious lump or concerns. Uh, getting into healthcare facilities and getting themselves tested. So obviously we have seen uh, the uh, uh, the later stage cancers uh, percentage increasing because of the COVID impact. I think that is one of the most significant impacts. We probably have seen a 15% increase in later stage tumors uh, that are being detected. Um, I don't think we have seen any published evidence on that yet, but that would be our uh, understanding and guess. Um, the otherwise now people are, I mean, coming back to the hospitals, et cetera, but there is an overall tendency and fear 
of not wanting to enter hospitals. I think so COVID has left us with some scars for sure, which again, even though there is no COVID around right now, or hopefully not in those numbers or that seriousness, uh, we still are seeing people who are afraid to come into hospitals. And I think that fear uh, is probably also causing for later detections, though I think things have improved over the last six to eight months, particularly. I think we answered the early detection and screening. I think there are there are many, many um, simple tests for men, women about the age of 40, about the age of 50. There are prescribed tests. I think there's enough literature and anybody who's interested, please email me. I can I can go into the details on that. At an individual level, it's about lifestyle cho choices, I think. I think being more aware of your health, uh, being more uh, self-aware, if I may, and spending time on mental well-being as well as physical well-being is extraordinarily important. I think we're living in a world which is a super fast uh, world. We have less time to really look at ourselves and what we are putting our bodies to through. I think the abuse, as it is called, even technically, that the body and our organs go through is a direct uh, is directly uh, resulting in a higher rate of cancers. I think the stress that we are taking, the food, the lack of food, the excess alcohol, the excess of smoking, the lack of sleep, these are things that have direct consequences. The genetic related cancers are just maybe 10 to 15%. Um, and we will still see cancers, but I think the rate of um, change in lifestyle, I think is a big uh, thing. The other reason is of course, uh, the, the fact that we have better screening devices and better detection devices also resulting in uh, more detection, which may not be a bad thing because we can do something about it if it is uh, detected. Thank you, uh, Suresh. This is a question from Monish uh, Kim. And um, his question is, thank you for your enlightening session. Being a healthcare management professional, leading the hospital operations, I'm very curious to know from you the potential impact of AI in healthcare delivery, uh, especially in the advent of uh, robot, robotic surgery, tech-enabled patient feedback mechanisms, etc. Thank you, Monish. Yeah, surely. I think AI uh, is increasingly will have a play a role to play. Uh, in all the three dimensions that you that I spoke to you about, right? The, the the big dimension where it can play a role is to provide consolidated views. And there are already tools available that are providing information to the doctors in terms of decision making, right? There are a lot of research articles that can be brought together for a specific patient. So understanding the patient's medical condition, the history, and using literature surveys and bringing all of that uh you know, there's a lot of talk today about chat GPT 4.0 being able to service. And there's already prototypes of that, that are being developed that can bring a lot of that decision-making support for the governance part or the right treatment part. The, the clinical delivery aspect of care, obviously there's a lot of usage of the data uh, and providing the information to the patient, uh, to the doctors who are providing the treatment. But also multidisciplinary teams can come to act together because we can cross-share that information. Uh, we can relate to what is the right treatment con treatment uh, decisions and the treatment changes in decision if we were able to bring the big data to support that patient. And I think there's, a, there's just a conference that I attended recent, uh, just uh, today, which talked about uh, applications of data. But there's also a lot of work that's happening in the clinical development field itself in terms of bringing newer drugs uh, to the market. And the last part, which is empathy, there is enormous amount of intelligence that we need. We don't need artificial intelligence. We just need human intelligence. We just need to bring the empathy and care that humans are good at rather than bring in, bringing in bots and robots. I think a large part of healthcare will improve if we just bring back what humans are really capable of, which computers are not. Thank you. Um, we have uh, another question from Mr. Um, uh, uh, Shailesh Mangadeshi's question is, you mentioned food and lifestyle. Has there been any connection established between mental health or stress with cancer? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of um, research and there's evidence now getting uh, published about a uh, direct correlations between stress uh, and the impact of stress uh, on uh, how you live your life, but also the impact of stress on cancers. Due to the fact that stress is a long duration uh, item, obviously the veracity of some of these data points is a question mark, but there is enough, enough I think, um, 
non-randomized clinical trial information, but a lot of data available to showcase that there is a direct consequence. Uh, we say that there is stress and you feel the pressure in your gut. This is not something that is just theoretical. There is enough evidence now that your gut really experiences a change when the stress levels goes up. Your brain definitely sees uh, changes. The functional MRI imaging now can showcase some of this in the brain activity with when you change stress levels. Um, your you know, mouth ulcers, for example, as a consequence of, of stress has been proven already. So there are many things which are directly correlated to stress. And I think realizing that is one thing. I think we all on this call, uh, I think, understand it. Uh, but we need to do something about it to get out of it, to figure out an improved lifestyle so that we can actually reduce that stress and keep it out of uh, impacting our lives. Uh, this is uh, another question from uh, Ramya Prasad. Her question is, as the cancers are specific, are the, uh, cancer are specific to body parts, when we get general diagnosis done, what should we say and to screen through all the body parts when we approach any hospitals? Thank you, Ramya. Thank you, Ramya. I think if you look at the different cancers, there's, uh, you know, there are broadly 10, 12 categories of cancers if you look at the body parts. And that's what we call an organ site approach to cancer care. So head and neck, breast, gynecological cancers like cervical, ovarian, the GI or gastro cancers and hepatobiliary cancers, the urological cancers, um, obviously cancers in the pediatrics, the blood cancers, and there are a few types of these. Uh, these are maybe eight to 10 category, orthopedic cancers, et cetera, right? Neuro cancers. So each of these have, are different biologically very often. At a cellular level, even, they are very, very different. Though there is a whole theory that many cancers could be common, we still are yet to find that single thing that connects to all cancers. We believe that there could be different biological, um, you know, we, we already know that the cell biologies of these are different. So unfortunately, the tests that you need to do are not the same to pick up all of these cancers. So the breast, for example, the, the above the age of 40 mammogram is a gold standard along with a sonomammogram for head and neck cancers, oral cancer screening with just oral visual inspection, as well as certain tests for dental screening, for example, for definitely can prevent, pick up uh, oral cancers early for gastro, the ultrasound, abdomen, pelvis. Uh, so there are Definitely some non-invasive things that you can do to catch 70% 70, 70 of all the cancers. Obviously, some of these you don't want to check without it. there being symptoms because you don't want to do invasive tests. About the age of 50, we recommend colonoscopies because that's invasive and the, the colon cancer uh, incidence is about 50 increases. So depending on age and risk profile, genetic history, uh, lifestyle risk, et cetera, a certain package of tests can be recommended for each individual. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Suresh. Uh, and the last question for today evening is uh, from Mr. Pratap Dev. And his question is, how do you see genetic profiling in the libraries for early detection of predisposed disease for future health care? Thank you, Pratap. Yeah, I think this is, the, this is really the holy grail. We think that there is a lot out there that we're going to learn through the genetic testing. The, the number of genetic tests that we are doing in the country today is very, very low because of the cost of testing. Also, because we are unable to use that as called actionable information, right? We don't have, um, uh, we may not be able to action uh, many of those results immediately. But I think having that information and being able to do large data analysis over a period of time has seen to be proven to be useful. In, For example, in the eye disorders, which are genetic, we're already seeing a great impact of genetic testing in large numbers being, being done by certain foundations that we subsidize the cost globally of this. The Blind Eye Foundation, for example, is a massive repository of genetic information of people who are blind and therefore are able to figure out what kind of treatments are available that can cure blindness for many of these people with genetic disorders. So there is a lot that has to be done in this field. The cost of genetic testing is reducing and i think as we see more and more people willing to get subject themselves to genetic testing we're going to see a lot more of this data becoming useful there are privacy concerns there are other concerns uh, that are that also have to be addressed obviously but i think on a very broad trend uh, if i would say this is the way it's going to go we are going to have very specific individualized information alongside with broad big data information that will help take decisions in terms of um, treatment and maybe even prevention for specific individuals with that uh, genetic information. 
Thank you so much, Suresh. Thank you for your time, especially uh, when you had a very busy day today. Like you said, you actually had to jump out of the previous meeting. But thank you so much from all of us. It's an absolute pleasure hope for having you. And then getting to know about you know, all, all that happens, uh, you know, to ensure that little thing always excellence with empathy. I think the photo that you see on your uh, thank you slide actually captures everything, the, the excellence with empathy. I think uh, right, that's what it is. But thank you so much from all of us, from all of our uh, wonderful participants for uh, you know, giving us your time. And also congratulations to you on your team for uh, 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 you know, uh, embarking on a wonderful journey with uh, great practices, because I'm sure the technology is available to everybody. I'm sure the best practices are available every morning. But I think uh, what differentiate you know, everybody, I mean, especially you know, people like you and your team, is what to take and how to implement it. I think that what makes all the difference. And like you rightly said, the, the right values. I think that's what you know uh, makes all the difference. Thank you once again from all of us, Suresh, and best wishes to you and your team. I look forward to hosting you for another session uh, with uh, uh, another great, you know, interesting story from Sidecare Hospitals. From all of us, thank you, thank you so much. So, thank you, Dr. Nagendra, Nandita, Murli, and the entire Times Pro team to host me today. Thank you. Thank you so much.